Um, yeah, so my slides are available on my website. I think Igor just posted the link to the chat if you want to follow along. Um, and I'll be talking about some uh, paper that's joint work with Christina Seryenko and Lauren Williams, and then another paper that's joint work with Chris Frazier. Okay, so um, everything in sight in this talk um, is going to be happening inside of some Grassmannian. Um, so just to fix some notation, pick positive integers, uh, k less than n, um, then the Grassmannian, GRKN, is just the space of k-dimensional subspaces of c to the n. Um, and I think I, I think about the Grassmannian exactly in the same way as everyone else, so there shouldn't be any surprises on this slide. Um, if you have some element of the Grassmannian V, um, you can choose to a representative matrix for it. Um, so this is going to be a full rank k by n matrix whose row span is V. Um, and I'm always going to be thinking about the Grassmannian as a projective variety with respect to the Pluger embedding. Um, so I have some Pluger coordinates. They're indexed by k element subsets of 1 through n. So pick one of those, call it i. Um, then the Pluger coordinate delta i of v is just the maximal minor of a representative matrix for v that's located in column set i. Um, and so these Pluger coordinates will generate the homogeneous coordinate ring of the Grassmannian. But of course, there are some relations among them um, called Pluger relations, very famous. Um, and there are a lot of them, but the ones we'll care about the most are the three-term ones. So they'll play kind of a special role in this talk. Um, and the three-term relations look like this. Um, if you haven't seen these before, it's not too important that you remember exactly what they are, um, just that they kind of have this general form. So I should say that, uh, let's see, I should say that i is less than j is less than k is less than l here. Um, and S is a k minus two element subset of one through n that's disjoint from i, j, k, n. Okay, so the varieties I'll be talking about today, they're sub-varieties of the Grassmannian, um, and their definition comes from total non-negativity. Um, so in the 90s, uh, Lustig defined the totally non-negative part of an arbitrary partial five variety, uh, g mod p. Um, and then later in very different language and independently, Posnikov defined the totally non-negative Grassmannian, but it turns out these two things are the same, um, but I'll mostly use Posnikov's language because he was a combinatorialist, he really dug into the combinatorics and that's what I'll, part of what I'll be talking about today. So what is the totally non-negative Grassmannian? Well, it's probably just what you think it is. It's um, all of those elements of the Grassmannian whose Pluger coordinates are non-negative. Um, Okay, so this space turns out to have some nice underlying combinatorics um, called posit. So the combinatorics we'll be paying attention to is the, that of positroids. So pick some element of the Grassmannian V, um, so some k dimensional subspace. Um, its matroid is just all of those k element subsets of 1 through n that index non zero Pluger coordinates of V. Um, so, right, this is like a combinatorialization of the subspace. Instead of caring about the values of each Pluger coordinate, which would specify the subspace exactly, all I care about is which ones are non-zero. Um, and if V is turn, was totally non-negative, um, then we call this its matroid a positroid. Um, and you should think of this as being a portmanteau for positively realizable matroid. Okay, so it turns out these positroids are a really, really nice class of matroids. Um, some examples, just to get you oriented. Um, so the uniform matroid, all k element subsets of 1 through n, that's a positroid. So this is saying there's a generic point in the Grassmannian, so a point with Pluger coordinates all non-zero, where in fact all Pluger coordinates are positive. Um, another example are Schubert matroids. So these are the matroids of um, generic points in Schubert cells. You can also describe them as um, the elements of this matroid are in bijection with lattice paths that fit in a rectangle above a given lattice path. Um, and also lattice path matroids are another nice class of positroid. These are the elements of these matroids are in bijection with lattice paths, paths that fit between two, two lattice paths. Um, okay, so there are some nice classes of matroids that are positroids, but um, in general, the reason why we're interested in positroids, or one reason that they're so nice, is that they're indexed by a whole bunch of combinatorial objects. 
um, most of which were invented by Posnikov. So just to give you an example, um, here's a positroid. So it's all three element subsets of one through six, except for three, four, five, and one, five, six. Um, and here are four combinatorial objects, which correspond to this matroid in some unambiguous bijective way. Um, the ones we'll care about the most in this talk are graphs that look like this. So they're planar and bicolored, plabic. Um, there's a whole family of plabic graphs that corresponds to each positroid. Um, and then the other thing we'll care about are these permutations. So um, positroids are indexed by what are called decorated permutations of n with k anti-exceedances. So decorated just means if there were fixed points, I would need to color them either white and black. Anti-exceedances are some uh, permutation statistic. Uh, but the point is, you know, I have one of these permutations for each positroid. Okay. So that's the combinatorics. Um, what about the geometry? I said the word variety in my title. So um, we're going to, throughout the whole talk, just care about these open positroid varieties. So um, that name was coined by Knuss and Lamb and Spire, um, and they gave a lot of proved a lot of different equivalent conditions of these open positroid varieties. Um, it turns out they're also like, so Knudsen and Spire give some combinatorial definitions, some geometric ones. Um, it turns out they're also equal to uh, projections of certain Richardson varieties from the full flag variety down to the Grassmannian. And these were studied previously by Lustig and Reach in the, in the context of total positivity. So, okay, what are they? Well. Okay, the notation is pi circ m, where m is a positroid. And so this is going to be all of those elements of the Grassmannian, um, v, where the smallest positroid containing the matroid of v is m. So this is a bit bigger than the realization space of the positroid, right? That would just be the elements of the Grassmannian whose matroid is the positroid. Um, so we're throwing in some extra stuff. So some elements of the Grassmannian whose matroids are not positroids um, but they're contained in M and not contained in any smaller positroid. Okay, so what sorts of varieties are we talking about here? Well, um, if you take M to be the uniform matroid, you get this um, big open positroid variety, which I call GR circ KN. So, um, okay, so we think which elements of the Grassmannian have matroid contained inside of the uniform matroid? And the answer is all of them. Um, but some of them, of course, will be contained, their matroids will be contained inside of some smaller positroid. So we need to throw away all of those. And it turns out that what you should throw away is exactly this, the, um, the subspaces where one of the cyclically consecutive Plucker coordinates vanishes. OK, so that's the big open positroid variety. Um, another nice example of positroid varieties are these open Schubert varieties. Um, so these are the ones that correspond to the Schubert matroids. Um, but you can also just define them without referencing that. So they're indexed by k element subsets of 1 through n. Um, so the one indexed by j is, OK, so you start with this, this thing, which is a Schubert cell. So just um, all of those elements of the Grassmannian, where delta j is the lexicographically minimal non-zero Plucker coordinate. And then you, again, you kind of have to, you have to throw away some stuff. So this Schubert cell is too big. Um, and so we're going to remove the zero locus of, again, n Plucker coordinates, um, which are determined entirely by j. I could tell you what they are, but it won't matter too much. You just have to throw some stuff away. OK, so we're actually going to want to talk about the coordinate ring of these, um, these open positroid varieties. And Knutz and Lamb and Spire show that there's a really nice like combinatorial way to describe the coordinate rings. So this open positroid variety, pi circ m, is cut out of the Grassmannian by fairly straightforward equations. Um, they're luckily kind of exactly the ones you would expect. So um, first, you need to make sure that delta i is 0 if i is not in m, right? That makes sure that the matroid of my subspace is going to be contained in m. And then to make sure that um, the smallest positroid the matroid of v is contained in is m, I need to make sure that n Plucker coordinates do not vanish. And these I1 through IN are uniquely determined by M, and they're not that hard to, to read off. I'm just not going to tell you exactly how. OK, so what that means is the homogeneous coordinate ring of pi circ M is just the coordinate ring of the Grassmannian. So that's polynomials and Plucker coordinates, modulo Plucker relations, um, 
quotiented by the ideal generated by delta i, where i is not an m, and then localized at these n Pucher coordinates. So we need to make sure that these things are units in this coordinate ring because they'll be non-vanishing on the variety. Okay, so that's what these positroid varieties are. Um, there are two things kind of to notice about them, which if you're a particular kind of mathematician would be exciting. And I guess if you're not, they won't be, but I want you to notice them anyway. Um, so the first is that there's a very natural way to define the positive part of this open positroid variety. Um, we've decided that certain Kluger coordinates are very important, right? Um, namely the ones that are indexed by elements of M. So we say that the positive part of this positroid variety is just all of those elements of the positroid variety where all of those Kluger coordinates are positive. Okay, this is the same as intersecting the positroid variety with the totally non-negative Grassmannian. Okay, so it turns out that this positive part um, is, in addition to like feeling very natural to define, um, is topologically very nice. Um, it's a cell, it's homeomorphic to an open ball. Um, and more, um, if you're interested in kind of testing if some point in the positroid variety is in the positive part, um, you have lots of Sub, like short subtraction free relations in this coordinate ring, which give you extra information about positivity. Um, it gives you the feeling like you could test your positivity like more efficiently than just by um, than just by testing the sign of every Kluger coordinate. So what I mean here is you have all these three term Kluger relations. So they look like this. Okay, and if you know that for some point in your positroid variety, these five Pluger coordinates are positive, then because of the way the Pluger relation is, you can also conclude that this last one is positive as well. So these short Pluger relations um, mean that you can test for positivity like more efficiently. Um, okay, so if you hang out with the right Russians, <laughs> these two things make you think, oh, well, maybe there's something special going on um, in the coordinate ring of this variety. Maybe it's a cluster algebra. Okay, so um, I, I promised in the abstract, you did not have to know what a cluster algebra is to understand this talk. So here's your brief overview. Um, so cluster algebras were introduced by Fomin and Zelovinsky um, around 2000. And what they are is there's some commutative rings um, and they have distinguished generators called cluster variables. Um, which are defined recursively. Okay, so what you should do is you should, so to make a cluster algebra, you start with some coordinate ring. Um, and really, I'm going to want to say like what it means for this coordinate ring to be a cluster algebra. So the first thing you do is you pick some initial seed of functions in this coordinate ring. Um, and the functions are going to be called, you're just going to call them cluster variables and you'll use them to label a directed graph. So um, here's an example of a seed for V equals GR24. Um, and I should say there are some technical conditions on this seed. You want all of the cluster variables to be algebraically independent. Um, and moreover, you actually want them to, to generate the field of, um, field of rational functions on V. Um, so for example, you, you know what size of seed you should pick. Um, should be like dimension of V many cluster variables. Okay, so you have that initial seed. And then um, what you can do from there is this thing called mutation, which is a local move to obtain a new seed. So um, this picture right here is an example of mutation at delta 2, 4. So this is an operation you perform at a vertex of your, of your directed graph. And what will happen is the arrows of the directed graph in the neighborhood of wherever you mutated will change, right? So I, the arrows are changing. And then the other thing that happens is whatever variable you mutated at, you'll switch it out for a new variable. So if you had the cluster variable x, you'll switch it out for a new cluster variable x prime um, so that x times x prime is this binomial. Um, so a and b are monomials and cluster variables, which you read off of the directed graph. Um, and exactly the way in which you do that, not that important for this talk. Um, but what you should know is like, for example, here, the 
um, this relation in this particular example actually ended up being a three-term Pluger relation. So you should think of mutations as being some sort of generalization of three-term Pluger relations. In the Grassmannian, the nice ones are exactly applying a three-term Pluger relation, and the not nice ones are doing something more complicated. Um, and the last thing you should know is you can't mutate everywhere. Um, so there are some variables which are special. They're designated as frozen. Um, and I usually write like a little box around them. And so you will not be able to mutate at these vertices. Um, and whoops, the frozenness sort of, uh, it's preserved under mutation, right? So I also can't mutate at these vertices in this seed either. OK, um, so. I don't, I know I didn't really go into too many details. So um, if anyone has any questions, please stop me. I'll try to clarify. Um, but if not, okay, so you start with this initial seed. You can pre perform this mutation at some vertex um, to get a new seed, and then you can keep performing these mutations. Um, so you'll get tons and tons of seeds all filled with cluster variables. Um, so you use these to define the cluster algebra. So the cluster algebra A sigma, that's kind of generated by your initial seed sigma, is just the polynomial ring in the cluster variables um, where coefficients are allowed to be Laurent polynomials in frozens. So the frozens play this special role, they're units. Um, and what it means for a coordinate ring to be a cluster algebra is exactly what you think. Um, it's equal to A sigma for some seed sigma that's chosen in this way. Okay. So, all right, um, you know what a cluster algebra is, but maybe right now you're thinking like, well, why would anyone ever want to show that a ring is a cluster algebra? Um, it seems like sort of a painful definition. You usually have infinitely many seeds. Um, yeah, so it kind of what's the point? Well, one of the most attractive features of cluster algebras, um, at least the nice cluster algebras, which are the ones we'll be dealing with today, is that they have a very nice basis. Um, a vector space basis um, with positive structure constants. And so this was kind of a big conjecture in the field for a long time. It was proved fairly recently by Gross, Hack, and Keel, and Kuntsevich. Um, and the point is that this basis, it's, it's not just like, oh, there is some nice basis. We don't know how to get to it. No, actually, the cluster variables are part of this basis. Um, and in fact, a little bit more is part of this basis. Um, so the cluster monomials, which are just monomials in the elements of any seed, um, these will also be part of this basis. So the cluster algebra, like proving that a coordinate ring is a cluster algebra tells you it has this nice basis and kind of identifying the cluster algebra structure gives you a big part of this basis, right? Just the cluster variables and the cluster monomials. So that's probably the key reason you'd wanna show um, that a coordinate ring is a, a cluster algebra. And then the other thing just to note about cluster algebras is that um, they kind of relate quite nicely to positivity. So um, I didn't write out this exchange relation very explicitly, but there are no minus signs in here. So if you iterate mutation, what you'll get are these long subtraction-free rational expressions. So all cluster variables can be written as subtraction-free rational expressions in the initial, initial cluster variables. And what this means, of course, is that if your initial seed is positive, then all of your cluster variables will be positive as well. Um, so the way you should think about this is each seed gives a positivity test for all the cluster variables. And I got cluster monomials as well. Um, yeah, so this is this is sort of nice. Um, the cluster algebra like this cluster thing actually gives you sort of these efficient positivity tests um, for the, the functions you've already identified as being important, right? Because they're part of this nice basis. So uh, do you know if the rest of the basis is also positive when you restrict to the positive part? Um, I would like to say yes. Um, I think you have positive Laurent expressions for arbitrary theta basis elements in terms of the initial cluster. It's just hard to actually come up with them. Oh, okay. um, Thanks. Yeah. OK. So, um, so kind of if you're a person who thinks about cluster algebras, um, maybe here's one way to think about the, some basic problems in the field. Um, 
So the first problem is just you want to show that your coordinate ring is a cluster algebra. Um, the second problem is that even though this cluster algebra like gives you all these cluster monomials, um, it's actually very difficult to identify the cluster monomial, like what functions these cluster monomials are on the variety, um, because the expressions you have are just these long rational expressions, or like um, it turns out you can get positive Laurent polynomial expand, um, expressions, but it's hard to say like if you have some nice generating set, like polynomial generating set, like the Pluger coordinates for this, it's hard to say what the cluster monomials are like in terms of the Pluger coordinates. So one, the next problem is explicitly describe as many cluster monomials, like in terms of Pluger coordinates, say, as possible. And this is the same problem as describing as many seeds as possible. And um, this sort of thing is exactly what I'll be talking about for the rest of the talk with positroid varieties. OK, so um, right. So I talked about positroid varieties, then I talked about cluster algebras. It should come as no surprise to you um, that I did that for a reason. So uh, the sort of historical cla classical result in this direction is that um, Scott showed in 2006 that the coordinate ring of this big open positroid variety is a cluster algebra. Um, and it's it's nicer than it just being a cluster algebra. So Scott didn't just say, oh, like you can find some seed, who knows what it is, and then that seed um, gives rise to this cluster algebra equal to this coordinate ring. Um, no, it turns out there's a very nice combinatorial source for seeds, um, namely Posnikov's Klebit graphs for this big open positroid variety. So these Klebit graphs are pictures that look like this. Um, and there's some combinatorial recipe by which you can go from this graph to a seed. So you write down some directed graph, and then each vertex of the graph will be labeled by a k element subset of 1 through n, which you'll interpret as a Pluger coordinate. I'll give you more details on this process later, because some of the subtleties will actually matter. OK, so of course, Kosnikov defined playbit graphs for more than just the Grossmannian. He also defined them for these kind of for arbitrary open positroid varieties. Um, so experts conjectured essentially since Scott's result um, that Scott's result should hold if you just replace the Grossmannian everywhere with an open positroid variety. It wasn't written down until like 2016, but was floating around for a lot longer than that. Um, so this conjecture is now solved. Um, so kind of as a first step towards solving it, together with Christina Seryenko and Lauren Williams, um, we showed that in the special case of open Schubert varieties, so for this um, special class of open positroid varieties, uh, playbit graphs for pi circ j give seeds for a cluster algebra structure on its coordinate ring. Um, so a key tool here was work of Leclerc on Richardson varieties in the full fly variety. So his work implied that this coordinate ring is a cluster algebra, um, but didn't actually provide, like it was very difficult to, from his work, get a seed for this cluster algebra. So what Christina Lauren and I did is we, we nailed down that combinatorics. We said like, yes, this combinatorics is exactly how to get seeds for this cluster algebra structure. Okay, and then a bit later, um, Pasha and Thomas Lamb proved um, the Muller-Spire conjecture in full generality. So we now know the homogeneous coordinate ring of an arbitrary positroid variety is a cluster algebra, and playbit graphs give seeds. So for an arbitrary positroid variety, so um, this result still uses the work of Leclerc, but for an arbitrary positroid variety, Leclerc's work sort of implies something weaker about open positroid varieties, so you have to do extra work. OK, so. Um, Another, so one nice feature just to say about this cluster algebra structure is that it kind of picks out the correct positive part of the variety. So we had already defined the positive part of positroid varieties that had previously been studied. Um, but as soon as, your as soon as your coordinate ring has a cluster algebra structure, there's a very natural way, again, a very natural way to define the positive part of the variety. It should just be all those points in your variety where all cluster variables are positive. And it turns out that for the open positroid variety, these two notions coincide. Um, and this follows from some work of Muller and Spire. So very concretely, what this means is um, if you take a playback graph for an open positroid variety, it gives you a positivity test for that positroid variety. So you, if you know that all of the Kluger coordinates 
from that clavic graph seed are positive, then in fact, um, all Pluger coordinates are positive. So um, the other thing to say is, if you don't really like cluster algebras, um, you can take the word seed in everything that I'm saying and just replace it with positivity test. Um, and that's another way to think about these things. Okay, so I've been talking now for a while. I keep saying these words playbook graphs and playbook graph seeds. Um, so I actually, there's some mysteries that come up in this cluster structure, um, but before I tell you about them, I have to tell you kind of more about what playbook graph seeds actually are. So um, I promise I'm not just giving you a lot of combinatorial information for no reason, it will actually be important. Um, okay, so first, what's a playbook graph of type Kn? Um, well, it's a planar graph. It should be embedded in the disk. Um, its internal vertices should be colored white and black. And this is, it's, this is pretty important. Its boundary vertices should, look, should be one through n going clockwise. So if someone hands you a picture like this, um, I told you you could get a seed from it. Okay, so um, to get a seed, first you need a directed graph. And that's basically just going to be the dual graph um, of this pl planar graph um, won't be too important for us. The one thing that will be important is that the boundary faces here are going to be frozen. So eventually I'm going to label all of the faces with k element subsets, but the labels of the boundary faces will be the frozen variables, so they'll be units. Okay, so now um, to obtain the cluster variables, what you do um, is you use these things called trips, which are walks on the graph, um, which follow certain rules of the road. So they're going to start at a boundary, so say five. And then if you hit a white vertex, you turn left. And if you hit a black vertex, you turn right. And then so now I've hit another white vertex, so I turn left. So I have a trip that goes from one to five. Um, to use it to label the faces, I'm just going to take the target of each trip so that is one here, and put it in all of the faces to the left of the trip. I have a one here and a one here. And then if I do this for all of the trips, um, in the end, so here I'll get a labeling that looks like this. So all of my faces will be labeled with K element subsets, and I'll interpret each of them as Pluger coordinates. Um, so one thing to say here is that I've made a convention choice. Um, which I've italicized, so <laughs> to try to make you notice it. Um, so I used the target of each trip to label the faces, but one could equally well use the source. Um, so if you do that, um, so if you do that, you actually get a different seed. So this is the one I got using the target labeling, and this is the one I get using the source labeling. So like here is the same trip, but its source is five, so I should put the five, I should put five in these two faces. Um, this is going to matter in a second. Okay, so now if someone hands you a graph, um, you can produce, in fact, two seeds from it. But you might be wondering, well, what positive variety is this a seed for? Um, and the answer is you should take all of the trips um, and they'll define a permutation. Um, so, right, you just say, where does the trip starting at one go? Where does the trip starting at two go, et cetera? Um, this permutation, called the trip permutation, will be a decorated permutation with k anti exceedances. So, it indexes a positive variety. Um, and it's that positive variety that your graph is a playbook graph for, and that your seed is a seed for. Um, and then just to say, um, I, this has been kind of implicit, but just to say it explicitly, um, if you take all of the seeds that come from a playbook graph with a fixed trick permutation, mu, like there are many different playbook graphs like that, all of these seeds will be related by mutation. So they'll all kind of show up in the same cluster algebra. Okay, so that's what a playbook graph seed is. Um, and now I can talk to you about some puzzles that show up in the cluster algebra structure for an open positive variety pi circ mu. Um, and these are, they're puzzles because, well, if you just look at them, they seem sort of puzzling, but also um, they don't happen in the case of the big open positive variety. So these, these were things that weren't seen after Scott's result, but now um, come up as issues now that we know that the coordinate rings of these guys are cluster algebra. So the first sort of puzzle um, is that there are a lot of non-zero Pucher coordinates, so Pucher coordinates that don't identically vanish on this positive variety, um, which do not show up in any playback graph seed. 
and they don't show up, in fact, in any seed in the cluster algebra. Um, so it's not clear how these Pluker coordinates like relate to the cluster algebra. And okay, the reason why this is puzzling is because the whole point of this cluster algebra structure on this coordinate ring was to find this basis. Um, and so, right, the basis should consist of like important functions on your variety. That's what you're saying. And we like to think of the Pluker coordinates as being, you know, quite important. So we would like to understand um, what role the Pluker coordinates play in the basis that's given by the cluster algebra. Um, and so, you know, some of the Pluker coordinates are cluster variables. Some of them will be um, Laurent monomials in frozen, so they'll be units, but other ones, like, just kind of who knows what they are. Okay. Um, another puzzling seed, uh, another puzzling thing is um, you have some seeds whose cluster variables are particularly simple. So they're not quite Pluker coordinates, but they're just Pluker coordinates times a Laurent monomial in frozen. And right, these are units, so these cluster variables are essentially Pluker coordinates. Um, but we have no combinatorial source, so we, we don't really know, we don't have some combinatorial object that's giving us seeds like this. It's just you can, you can perform some mutations and you get to a seed like this and you feel like you've gotten lucky. Um, and so, right, so Klebit graph seeds just give you Pluker coordinate cluster variables. You don't, you don't see this Laurent monomial and frozen showing up. That's another mystery. Um, and remember kind of the, one of the problems once you've shown your cluster, uh, sorry, once you've shown your coordinate ring as a cluster algebra is you want to um, understand as many seeds as explicitly as possible. Um, so it feels like these are kind of seed that we want to understand. Um, and then the last thing, which is the thing that sort of brought, uh, drew Chris and Mai's attention, um, is that these convention choices, the choice of using the source labeling or the target labeling to get a seed, actually really matters. Um, so there's no sequence of mutation mutations between these two seeds. Um, and this is for a really, really easy, straightforward reason. If you look at the target seed from this graph and the source seed from this graph, they just have different frozen variables. Um, so 3, 4, 6 is a frozen variable over here. It's not over here. And since we can't mutate at frozen, I mean, there's just no way to take this seed and perform a sequence of mutations and get this seed. But this is very puzzling, right? Because um, what this means is that if you make a different convention choice, so on the one hand, you'll get the, say, the target cluster algebra. And on the other hand, you'll get the source cluster algebra. They'll be equal as rings. They'll be equal to the coordinate ring of this positroid variety. But the cluster variables and the frozen variables will be different. So one question is, um, well, what's the relationship between these two cluster algebras? Do they? give rise to the same basis of the coordinate ring? Or are they giving me like genuinely different information about this coordinate ring? OK, so um, our first result um, doesn't really explain puzzle three, but it kind of puts it into a larger context. So it turns out um, the, this homogeneous coordinate ring can be identified with many different cluster algebras. So they'll all have different frozen variables and different cluster variables. Um, but their seeds will all come from a, a very nice combinatorial source. So seeds will be given by relabeled Klebit graphs um, with the correct trip permutation. So the same trip permutation as indexes the positroid variety. So OK, what does relabeled Klebit graph mean? Well, it just means that, OK, so for a usual Klebit graph, on the boundary, I need to see one through n going clockwise. Relabeled Klebit graph just means I see something else when I look at the boundary. So here's an example um, for a particular positroid variety in GR36. Um, so here are four seeds. This one is just a usual Klebit graph seed. Um, and then these three are relabeled Klebit graph seeds because their boundaries are shuffled. Um, and so all of these seeds give a cluster algebra which is equal to the coordinate ring of this positroid variety. Um, but you can just see, like immediately, they all have different frozen variables and they'll also all have different cluster variables. Um, and I guess one thing that I'll say is that, um, in some precise sense, all of these different cluster algebras are actually interpolating between like the target cluster algebra and the source cluster algebra. 
Um, so it, this sort of this result kind of puts the source and target inside of some bigger like sequence of cluster algebras that are all equal to this coordinate ring. Okay, so um, just to take a second, you might be thinking, okay, what's the big deal with this relabeling? Like, why is this why is this like an important thing to do, or why does this like do anything at all? Um, so. So it might seem like a very innocent thing to do, right? You just have some playbook graph and then you say, oh, I'm just going to apply some permutation to its boundary. So like here, I applied the permutation. Um, over here, I just applied the permutation that swaps two and three. Um, but because of the way the seed is defined from the playbook graph, this is actually a very big deal. So for example, here, um, we have this trip, which goes from one to three. So that tells me um, that in the seed from this graph, I'm going to have a three in all of these spaces. But of course, over here, I have the same trip, but now it's labeled, um, now it, its target is two. So I'll have a two in all of these spaces, right? So I'm, I'm changing all of the face labels. But also this relabeling is changing the trip permutation, right? Because I've, I've messed with where the trips end by relabeling the graph. Um, so this Playbit graph over here, we already said it should be for the positroid variety indexed by its trip permutation. Um, and so if someone hands you a relabeled playbit graph, so these were things that weren't really addressed in the literature previously, they came up a few times. So if someone hands you a, a relabeled playbit graph like this, your best guess is that it should be for the positroid variety that's indexed by like the trip permutation of this graph. Um, and it's, it's not so hard to see that when you relabel by some permutation V, the way the trip permutation changes is by conjugation by V. So our best guess is that this playbit graph is for the positroid variety indexed by V inverse mu V. Okay, so um, the problem is, is that this guess is sometimes very bad um, so in some situations, this seed that you get from the relabeled playbook graph with this trip permutation just won't make sense as a seed for this open positroid variety at all. Um, so there are a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, the first most obvious thing that could go wrong is that maybe the face labels of this playbook graph are five element subsets, um, but this positroid variety lives inside of like GR4N. Um, so maybe the face labels don't even make sense as coordinates on this positroid variety. Um, another thing that could go wrong is just um, this graph could have the wrong number of faces. So to be a seed for this positroid variety, um, okay, this is a projective variety. So in fact, we need to have the dimension of the right variety plus one many faces in our graph. So if it just doesn't have the right number of faces, it definitely won't make sense as a seed. And so what Chris and I do is basically we identify precisely which relabeled playback graphs actually make sense as seeds. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll just I'll just flash this slide. Um, I don't really want to get into the details, um, but basically, if someone hands you a relabeled playback graph with trip permutation mu, um, this gives a seed for the positroid variety, i.e., the cluster algebra from this relabeled playbook graph is equal to the coordinate ring, exactly when you would think this playbook graph makes sense as a seed. Um, so this part is true exactly when this relabeled playbook graph has the number of faces that you think it should have. Um, and I should say we're assuming sort of a technical condition up here, which I'm going to ignore. <laughs> um, and then just in case, um, people in the audience have been exposed to playbook graphs before. Um, I'll also say that the this um, relabeled playbook graph having the right number of faces, it turns out to be equivalent to the face labels being weakly separated. Um, so weak separation is really important for usual playbook graphs. And it turns out it also picks out exactly the relabeled playbook graphs, which are like meaningful, which also gives seeds. OK. So, um, back to being vague. Um, okay, so we now we know that this coordinate ring has kind of many different cluster algebra structures given by relabeled playbook graphs. Um, and you might be thinking, well, 
that's kind of cool, I guess, but now you're in sort of an even worse situation than you were before, because it's not, now you don't just have source and target. Um, you have tons and tons of different cluster algebra structures on one coordinate ring, and you have the same questions, like what is the relationship between all of these cluster algebras? So we also have results in this direction. Um, we can kind of show these in for special classes of positroid varieties, but conjecture and have some like pretty strong support that they hold in general. So um, for open Schubert varieties, um, it turns out that all of these relabeled playbit graph cluster algebras are the same up to frozens. So this is, um, you can make this very precise. Um, the precise words are they quasi coincide. This was something that Chris developed in his thesis. Um, but one, one way to think about it is all of these cluster algebras actually have the same cluster monomials. So all of these cluster algebras are picking out the same basis. Um, the other, another nice thing about being the same up to frozens is that it means I can take a relabeled playbit graph seed and I can just rescale it by frozens in some way um, to get seeds in, for example, the target cluster algebra. So for example, here, um, here is a seed from a relabeled playbit graph, but I can just rescale it. So I just need to multiply by this monomial and frozens and this monomial and frozens. And I also, I have to do something funny with the frozen here, um, but I can just rescale and I'll get a seed in the target cluster algebra. So that is a cluster algebra coming from target seeds of usual playbit graphs. Um, so this is great. It means that all of these different cluster structures, you can actually use them. Um, you can actually use them to obtain more seeds in a fixed cluster structure. So this is this is kind of the thing that's like quite exciting is um, we can use these many different cluster algebras to understand this like fixed cluster algebra better. Um, and so, like I said, so we can show this for the open Schubert varieties and also like open opposite Schubert varieties, but our conjecture is that this theorem should hold in general. Um, and we have partial results. Basically, we can show, we have sort of clumps of these relabeled playbit graph cluster algebras where we can show that all the ones in a clump are the same up to frozen, but then we have trouble connecting the clumps. <laughs> um, another, another kind of support for this conjecture is that all of the relabeled playbit graph algebras give rise to the same positive part. Um, so the same positive part is the one given by the target cluster algebra. So another way to say that is all of these relabeled playbit graphs that we're looking at actually give positivity tests. So that's a good indication that the cluster algebras are closely related. Could you briefly say, say how, to, how you do that uh, last part, that they give positive tests? How do you prove that? Uh, um, so, Basically, um, we use the we use we basically use twists. Um, so we introduce yeah. So um, this is something that I this is something that I glossed over. Um, part of like thinking about these um, relabeled playbit graph cluster algebras is um, we we use a permuted twist map. Um, to move from one positroid variety to another. And um, you have all of kind of the same commutative diagrams that you have in the Muller Spire twist paper, but with a column permutation at some end. Um, and, so, and so you get similar results, um, kind of similar things that you could deduce about, say, the target cluster algebra from the Muller Spire paper. You can also deduce about all of these relabeled like the graph cluster algebras. I see. That, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, oops, let me, yeah, we actually, we were like very fond of this, um, this sort of strategy. Um, this, it turns out that this permuted twist map um, gives you, so usual twist map is an automorphism of a positroid variety, but this permuted twist map is an isomorphism between two different positroid varieties. Um, yeah, so we were, we were quite fond of it, which is why I put it on the slide. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so just to summarize, um, okay, so the point of this is that we have a new combinatorial source for seeds in like the target cluster algebra on a positroid variety. 
um, and that combinatorial source are these relabeled playback graphs with the right trip permutation. Um, right, and we have to restrict our attention to the relabeled playback graphs that make sense, but we know which ones those are. Um, and the great thing about these seeds is that, well, so what I did is I took a relabeled playback graph seed and then I just rescaled it by frozens appropriately. So the cluster variables of this seed look like a Pluger coordinate times some Laurent monomial in frozens. So these were exactly the seeds with like simple cluster variables that we had no combinatorial understanding of before, basically. We just felt lucky when we found one. Um, and now we have this kind of very nice combinatorial source for them. Um, and so there are a bunch of questions that come up either like because of this result or that we now feel like we can tackle better because we have these seeds. So kind of the first very natural one is, are these relabeled playback graphs like a complete source for seeds that look like, like cluster variables are Kluge coordinate times Laurent monomial and frozens? Um, and so this is like an analog of a result of O Posnikov and Spire on the, just the Grassmannian case where usual playback graphs are an exhaustive combinatorial source for the Pluger coordinate seeds. Okay, and then another question, this was like the first puzzle was what relationship do the Pluger coordinates have to this cluster algebra structure? Um, the conjecture is that all Pluger coordinates should be cluster monomials. Um, but the problem was we just didn't have access to enough seeds in the cluster algebra to show this. So Chris and I are hoping um, now that we have more seeds, we have all these relabeled playback graph seeds, we can show that all Pluger coordinates are cluster monomials like from some relabeled playback graph seed. Um, and then if you're a combinatorialist um, and feel like you don't really care about this cluster algebra stuff. Um, there are also just like purely combinatorial questions that arise from this construction. So um, what we saw is that, okay, so playback graphs are something that were very meaningful for positroids previously. And it turns out that you can just relabel them and still get something that's meaningful. So you can ask, um, can you play the same game with the other combinatorial objects which index positroids? And there are a lot of them. Um, Chris and I thought about they're relabeled versions of the Grossman necklaces, um, which also come up in some work of Pasha with Miriam Farber. Um, but you could also ask, like, can you find a relabeled lead diagram that's meaningful somehow? Um, and then the last thing is um, usual playback graphs have a really, the face labels of usual playback graphs have a very, very nice combinatorial characterization. This is by O. Posnikov and Spire, um, just in terms of weak separation and the positroid. So you could ask, um, can you characterize relabeled playback graph seeds in a similar way? Um, so we kind of give part, I mean, the relabeled playback graphs we're interested in, their face labels are certainly weakly separated, um, but we, yeah, we don't have like a, just a complete combinatorial characterization of what their face labels look like. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there. Thanks for listening.